Um, as we look at American national identity, this idea of freedom, industrial, uh, Spanish-American war unites us, that we have this idea of a common goal. Uh, what was the war before the Civil War that kind of united North and South? Mexican-American Mexican -American War. Yeah, I mean, we kind of forget about that. But the Mexican-American War, we were united, okay? Um, I mean, sure, you had people like, you know, the Irish who more identified with the Mexicans because of the Catholic culture, because of the affinity with beer, cervezas, ha, 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 with, you know, dancing and just family, right? So, like, the Irish and the Mexicans actually, like, whenever somebody says, like, oh, like, uh, my dad's Mexican, my mom's Irish or something like that, I'm like, Mexican-American war, you know? I always go back to history because, like, that was such a common thing is for an Irish person to marry um, a Mexican person because of that shared culture, okay? Whereas Protestant America, that was kind of, like, you know, separate. So um, after the Civil War, we definitely have this uniting of Americans with the Spanish-American War, then World War I, you know, and we, we, we really kind of forget what it means, this North versus South, free versus slave. Good. Uh, what about when it comes to politics? Um, you know, when it comes to blacks, uh, politics, um, was there this uh, citizenship given to blacks? You know, maybe kind of a brief period of citizenship for blacks. Black men in the South ends with Reconstruction, right? So, uh, brief uh, citizenship uh, for blacks uh, ends with Reconstruction. Okay, and why does Reconstruction end? Do you remember? Uh, a little bit before that. 1877. What's up? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, Americans have a short attention span. We get tired of an endless occupation of Union troops in the South, and we just get tired of it, right? And so we start having these Jim Crow laws uh, in the South, which are segregation laws, right? Segregation um, laws. And, um, you know, the, uh, the Republicans are in power during this time period, right? Republican... Uh, power, which if you remember, Republicans are very good at like pro-business because they're, they're um, you know, um, laissez-faire, pro-laissez-faire. So even when it comes to like social things and everything, Republicans usually are not ones to jump in there and to protect blacks and things like that socially. Uh, then we have uh, work exchange technology. Um, do we become the leading uh, industrial power? Yes. Definitely. Okay. So world's uh, industrial, you know, leading industrial power, right? Um, that's, that's good. Uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, labor for immigrants, is it, is it bad? Is it good? I'd say pretty harsh, right? Harsh labor for immigrants, right? Excellent. That's good. Love it. Well done. Um, we also have the robber barons, right? Robber barons uh, of this golden of this gilded age um, and gilded age. Now, when we say that term gilded age, what does that mean? Is that a positive term? Uh, yeah, ish. Uh, I, it, it was coined by Mark Twain. So if Mark Twain says something, is it gonna be kind of like Babylon B type? Yeah, okay. <laughs> It's, it's going to be satire, right? Okay? Mark Twain was king of satire. So he said something, and people were like, yeah, that's right, I am. And then they were like, wait a second, Mark Twain just said something. Ah, uh, it must have been a backhanded compliment or something, right? Um, so, you know, this Gilded Age is this thin layer of gold. Um, so it looks really nice on the outside, but deep down, there's a lot of issues still right so immigrants were coming to america you know it's the it's the land of freedom and opportunity which which it was but at the same time there were still a lot of issues especially with mafias and stuff when it comes to culture how are we viewing um you know immigrants and people of uh non-white descent social darwinism right 
in ism. Uh, this social Darwinism, uh, you know, believing that, you know, uh, through evolution that some are better and more fit and others aren't, right? Um, very good. Um, then when it comes to migration, uh, these immigrants, you know, we have these new immigrants uh, from South and Western. Eastern Europe, right? Eastern Europe. So we're talking about, you know, the Russian pogroms against the Jews. We're talking about the Italians in the South, the Poles, right? Um, good. Um, and also the frontier, frontier is closed, okay? It's this end of manifest destiny, right? Um, then when it comes to geography, um, how are the cities? Urban. Okay, good. So we got these urban cities, you know, filled with uh, pollution, you know, illness and stuff filled with. Um, and then, you know, the West is conquered uh, with barbed wire and buffalo dead, right? So when we talk about geography, um, barbed wire, you know, conquers uh, the West. Okay, uh, the West. Uh, this barbed wire, because what does barbed wire do? Uh, it is a fence, right? And whenever you create these fences, do uh, animals are animals able to graze and roam as they wish? No, this barbed wire, you know, it keeps, you know, people in line and everything, right? So it really kind of conquers the West. This, this wild West is not wild anymore. Um, then when it comes to America and the world, um, this is, you know, the end of, uh, what's that term? What's that I term? Isolationism. Isolationism. Very good. End of isolation. Relationism. Okay, forever we will intervene with the world. We will interact with the world. Before this, you know, we really weren't. Um, we constantly retreated back into just America, but that's kind of the end of that. Also, um, you know, Native uh, American uh, ways um, are nearly gone. Does anybody remember that term? Or, or that, uh, that act that was established, the Dawes Act. Very good. That Dawes Act, uh, it made it so that um, Native Americans were reading and writing, which sounds really good, and becoming more American, but they lost their tribal sovereignty. So America was able to basically control people if they individualize you versus if you're a collective group. So as long as the Cheyenne were a collective group together, they could bargain with America and they had foreign policy with America. But once the Cheyenne are now Americans, they have to obey the constitution. They have to obey the laws. Do you see the trade off there? I mean, can you imagine like, you know, what's the right idea? And you have some chiefs like Chief Washaki uh, up in Montana that is constantly trying to run away uh, his group from the U.S. Army, and they almost make it to Canada, to the land of freedom. And then the U.S. government like traps him and everything. And he basically has to, like, he's one of the last mighty uh, chiefs, and he realizes to spare his people that they have to become Americanized, right? And so there's kind of this um, trade-off, you know, like, do I want to be more American or do I want to embrace my culture? So America and the world. Remember that American uh, foreign policy is with Native Americans. Good. And then we have uh, kind of this 1890 to 1945. How fun. Uh, we have that era. Um, so looking at that era, um, uh, era seven, uh, it's a big section. Um, we have, um, you know, new European immigrants, you know, at the first, you know, were considered not American, by the, but by the end of World War II are really considered white, right? So immigrants, um, 
you know, start uh, being uh, accepted uh, by World War II. Okay, so kind of during this time period, there's kind of that acceptance of, you know, oh yeah, you're 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 American. Yeah, right. Okay, we're kind of this new world power. Okay, so we're kind of you know really establishing ourselves. Um, we also have um, federal uh, government intervenes in economy. Okay, so we kind of have this new this new um, idea of going against laissez faire. Right, so we used to be so laissez-faire, um, hands off. But what event makes us start to feel like the government needs to prime the pump of the economy? The Great Depression. The Great Depression. Very good. Okay, and so we start embracing Keynesian economics. Keynesian economics focuses on that businesses will grow again if people have money. So the idea is. The government gives people money, uh, direct cash relief, and then they spend it on the economy. We don't do that today, do we? Yeah. Oh, what is it called today? Stimulus. Anybody know? What was that? A stimulus. a stimulus. Okay, it's a stimulus bill. Stimulus bill is to stimulate the economy. It's not to stimulate your neurons, you know? Oh, yeah, I'm getting stimulated off this money. No, it's to stimulate the economy. Unless you're somebody like Mr. Malumbi, which the government hates people like me that just pay bills when I get the stimulus money. I'm like, oh boy, I can pay bills. And they're like, no, we want you to spend it on the economy, right? Um, so that was um, FDR's new kind of new Democrat, if you will. He, 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 FDR really, when people say, oh, I'm an FDR Democrat, I mean, I don't think that we have any more FDR Democrats, people that voted for FDR. I, I think, tra sadly, tragically, um, all of our Great Depression, World War II, people are, are pretty much uh, passed away. Um, but um, that, was, that was kind of a, a big new identity. Uh, politics, okay? Um, Wilson, um, you know, Wilson uh, is present during World War, uh, World War One, FDR, World War Two, right? The two Democrats, um, two major Democrats during World War One and World War Two. Um, uh, what about uh, female suffrage? Yeah, okay, suffering till suffrage. Uh, that would be the 19th uh, Amendment, right, uh, in 1920. Uh, also, um, is there still segregation? No. Yes, okay. It's not until after World War II. And we're talking about three years after World War II that the um, U.S. government and the military gets desegregated. And that's because uh, Harry Truman... He sees these heroes, these soldiers coming back to, you know, a place that, like, they thought had changed, you know? When uh, these blacks were accepted in France, uh, accepted as equals in, in the Netherlands, uh, and then to come back to America, it was like, oh, yeah, that's what America's like, okay? And so Harry Truman hated that, okay? And he went to Congress. No other president uh, would do this, right? He went to Congress, and he's like, you guys need to need to do something about this. And so, um, again, it was those who had sacrificed. Does anybody remember what that was called when victory over there meant, meant victory over here? The double victory? The double V, the double V, right? Um, so, you know, um, so we have uh, Segre... Segregation continues, uh, but then after World War II, we're going to see it um, start to start to wane. Um, but uh, um, you know, continues. But blacks uh, ready for civil uh, rights. Uh, were there any civil rights protests during World War II? 
You betcha. Okay, the first March on Washington. The March on Washington that we always remember is the MLK. I have a dream speech. Uh, but the initial March on Washington, there's been many March on Washingtons. It hasn't just been uh, blacks. Unions have also marched on Washington. Um, but uh, they, the, the African Americans were, vote, were uh, wanting equal job access during World War II. Uh, and they got it um, with that March on Washington. So when it comes to uh, work, exchange, technology, um, you know, are we, uh, what, what are some things that we're starting to invent during this time period? Do you think the radio? Yeah. Cars, right? Flight even? Flight. Okay. Uh, I would say TV will be the next era, right? Um, you know, phones. Okay. Yeah, I know, right? Flight. Oh, it just doesn't like my comma for some reason. <laughs> um, you know, the phone, uh, when it comes to um, laissez-faire economics lead to a stock market crash, right? So we have the laissez-faire uh, uh, leads to stock market uh, crash, right? When there's, when there's, um, you know, hey, you know, you can throw all your money into the stock market and not even worry about a thing. Uh, you're either going to do really well or, or not at all. When there's no regulation, okay, in 2008, we wanted everybody to be in houses. And so we didn't care if somebody couldn't afford a house. So when all of a sudden people couldn't afford houses, all of a sudden, they went upside down, and what's going to happen, right? Um, when people can't pay their mortgages. Um, the New Deal, World War II, ends uh, depression. So we have the New Deal, FDR's New Deal, to help with the uh, depression, um, you know, helps. But World War II ends uh, Great Depression. Um and then, uh, do we have a post-war boom? I know that's kind of a little bit later, uh, but definitely yes. Uh, when it comes to culture, um, you know, uh, is there during the 1920s what uh, uh, what what's America's culture like in the 1920s? It's like the Roaring Twenties. Yeah, the Roaring Twenties. What's what's in what? What did uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald call that age? No, nope. we just went over that one. The what age? Jazz. The jazz age. Yeah, F. Good old F. Scott. Okay, the jazz age. Okay, this jazz age. Um, you know, uh, in New York, what city in New York do blacks have their own? Harlem Renaissance, very good. Harlem Renaissance, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, before this Harlem Renaissance, um, black was seen as bad. It's not until the Harlem Renaissance that all of a sudden there's all this culture that is seen as positive, okay? I would say that hip-hop, 80s hip-hop, really kind of starts in this 1920s Harlem Renaissance jazz age, okay? Because before this time period, it was nothing but segregation, you're down, you're this and that, and there was no look at, hey, these people have a culture um, to, to, to listen to. And a lot of whites start listening to black music. I'm a believer that um, rock and roll um, really did a lot more for civil rights than we really give it credit. Okay, but that's a little bit later. But same thing with jazz, okay? Because if you can listen to black music uh, and still be racist and everything, like, you know what I'm saying? There's still people that would, right? Like, hey, I'm not going to invite a black musician into my house, but I'm still going to enjoy the music type of thing. But I think that that would start to, kind of, that's kind of the con uh, cognitive dissonance, right? It kind of wanes over time. Um, good. So we got culture, um, you know, during the 1920s, was there any, uh, you know, 
what, what, what happened to that KKK that kind of scurried off into their cave for a little bit, and then in the 1920s, did they have a resur resurgence? Yes, KKK. Um, so remember that by the 1920s, blacks were still down, so are blacks really the, the, the threat to the KKK? Who's the new threat to the KKK in the 1920s? Immigrants. Okay, it's immigrants. Very good. So KKK, focus uh, on attacking um, immigrants during this time period. Uh, this time period, we also have the first Red Scare, right? Um, and maybe that's a little bit more political, but I guess we could put it in... Um, in uh, in this time, you know, the, the, the first Red Scare, first uh, Red Scare. Uh, do you all remember Sacco and Vanzetti? Yeah. Sacco and Vanzetti, they were Italiano, right? Sacco and Vanzetti. Were they, were they really communist? They actually were. Yeah, they were. Yeah. Did they commit the homicide, though? No. No. It was politically motivated. All of the witnesses, you know, conflicted their stories and everything. It just, it was a terrible court case. And these two guys got the death penalty for a crime they didn't do. But it was politically motivated. That was part of this first Red Scare. This is not McCarthyism. This is not, uh, what's that book that you had to read on on, uh, on this time period? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, yeah, this is not the crucible. This is not the crucible, right? Uh, the crucible is not about Puritan history, right? I mean, it's the setting is, but it's an allegory, ladies and gentlemen, of the Great Red Scare or the Second Red Scare, right? So again, remember, there's two Red Scares, the 1920s Red Scare and the 1950s Red Scare. Both are after world wars. Uh, when it comes to migration, uh, the warmth of... The Warmth of Other Suns was a book written on this. The Migration from the South to the North. What was that during World War I? The Great Migration. Great Migration. The Great Migration of who? Great Migration of Blacks to, to cities, right? To cities, okay? And, and uh, industrial, right? Industrial work, okay? Because again, remember, ladies and gentlemen, um, black people uh, were working uh, what in the South? Okay, crops, but give me an A-push term. Share crops. There we go, okay, sharecropping. So they went from sharecropping to these new opportunities in the North. Right? So that was a huge shift too. Okay? Uh, do you think the North or people, you know, in the North would have, you know, wanted to end racism if they didn't even know that it was happening? You know what I'm saying? So when blacks start moving to the North, that starts like opening up like, Oh gee, I, I didn't I didn't realize that was happening type of thing, right? Um, then we have um, let's see uh, we have the first um, so we have uh, a million one million uh, plus immigrants uh, coming to America to America. And so in 1924, we make the uh, Immigration um, Quota, the Emergency Quota Act, right? Um, emergency Quota Act. Was that the one based on like 40 years ago? Um, Where they took the census? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Um, and they cut immigration down to 3% of your native country, like the 3% population thing. So the Emergency Quota Act limited a lot of immigration because of the 1920s, 
we were sur super worried about um, the Red Scare, about communism coming in from uh, from uh, Ital Italy and Italy. such. Italia. Um, so, you know, going back to era six, we kind of did forget about that um, uh, Chinese Exclusion Act, didn't we? Or did we mention any of that in here? We, we mentioned, Act. yeah, yeah, we mentioned the, uh, the um, 19, or the 49ers, right? Yeah, we did. Didn't we do that? Okay, so we mentioned the 49ers, and I'm seeing if Native is hate of immigrants, right? Um, so that's good. I guess that in this era, the reason I'm mentioning Chinese Exclusion Act is because last year's DBQ totally like had a document on Chinese Exclusion Act. However, that means that it probably won't this year. But like again, we're kind of like, ooh, you know? So I would maybe put Chinese uh, Exclusion um, Act uh, here, okay? Um, so that really focused on Chinese that We'll take uh, people from other countries, but not from China. There was that um, xenophobia towards uh, towards Asians uh, there. Uh, then we also have geography. Um, when it comes to uh, geography, uh, we have these, uh, you know, new technology makes world smaller place, right? Um, we also have this con uh, con um, conservation movement. Conservation movement uh, starts um, and uh, you know begins. Uh, wh why do we start? Why does Teddy Roosevelt get us to start? You know, conserving our natural resources, conserving our uh, making these national parks and everything. Why does he do that? Teddy Roosevelt, John Muir, California. Why do we have so many parks in California, national parks, and also throughout the rest of the world, or the rest of America? To preserve. To preserve. Yeah. Okay, um, does America have any really, really old history or really, really old buildings or anything? No, we don't have the pyramids. We don't have the Parthenon. We don't have the Colosseum. We don't have these like really old, but but what does America have? You know, when, when people come to America, you know, when you go to these national parks, do you ever like say something to somebody and then all of a sudden that like, they talk to you back in like Dutch or German or, uh, you know, some other language? And you're like, oh, you're not American. And they're like, you know, Yeah. something in their language, right? Um, so, so I say that because, um, you know, we want to uh, basically uh, preserve, um, preserve our, 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 our American landmarks, you know? Um, preserve the wilderness, really, because that's what America's known for. Okay, we don't get this because like we're so used to America, but when people come from other countries and study in America, they're like, wow, like, you know. You, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's good. Um, when it comes to geography, um, why did America not get hurt by World War I or World War II? What protected us? Yes, okay, so, you know, oceans uh, protect America, okay? That's definitely it, right? Um, when it comes to geography, maybe this is a little bit more of working exchange technology, but, you know, we de develop an atomic bomb, too. Atomic bomb, okay? Uh, and that atomic bomb, um, that uh, really kind of, sets up this possible uh, destruction of the environment, geography, and such. Uh, then when it comes to America and the world, what are the main uh, events that we have? We have the Spanish-American uh, War. We have World War I. Um, then we have this era of isolation, 
right? 1930s and 40s, or sorry, 1920s through 1930s, uh, isolation era. Um, but then we have World War II, um, and we become forever, uh, forever uh, interventionist, right? And we kind of become that, uh, forever interventionist. Um, let's do a little bit of Unit 8, or Era 8, and then we'll have a break, okay? Uh, interventionism, yeah, oops. Um, so national, um, uh, national identity, uh, when we go from 1945 to 1980, um, does the uh, federal government expand at all? I would say yeah, okay, especially with Lyndon Baines Johnson, right? Um, and so the federal government expands, uh, expands, uh, uh, really expanding its powers to, to what? I would, I would say, you know, really expands uh, civil uh, rights. And this is not just civil rights for uh, people of color, but this is also civil rights like criminal rights, right? Like we talked about Miranda rights and, and, uh, and things like that. So um, uh, there would be a protection of rights. Um, did you know that you are allowed to protest as long as your protest is not a distraction in school. So you're allowed to wear an armband if it protests the Vietnam War. That's exactly what happened in Tinker versus Des Moines, okay? Is that um, a couple of students had armbands on to protest the Vietnam War, and the school wanted to tell them to take them off. But it technically wasn't a distraction to anybody. Now, if they would have come to school, you know, with hardly any clothes on, that would have been a distraction in school, and that protest is not protected under the Constitution, okay? Um, are the rules different here because it's a private school? Yeah, yeah, so we are a private school, so, but even with that, like, there's a limited amount of protest that's okay. Like, for example, when the senior class today, you know, did the protest of, uh, you know, backpacks and everything, you know, anything but backpack, uh, that didn't uh, distract. Now, could it have distracted, like, you know, the little children coming to school? Uh, it could have, but uh, at the same time, we didn't want to make a huge deal of it, right? Like, that was pretty bold. Like, that goes in the history books. Honestly, the seniors, like, they made history at Christian High. In the parking spot, you know about that. Oh, oh you know about that? Oh, that was hilarious. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Bad parking. Know what, though? My senior year, that was our senior prank. prank. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> know what? The one year, the one, the one year that I was Miss Margie, uh, my second year at CHS, I was Miss Margie, and I helped the senior class park, like, up here, uh, like right before school started, I had them all park up here so that like people couldn't like use the stairs or whatever. <laughs> it was super annoying. Um, it was a good prank though. I thought it was good. That's good. And I and I never got harmless, in trouble. That's What's up? It was harmless. Yeah, exactly. Harmless, clever. That's what you want. All right. Back to national uh, identity. Um, so we have this um, USA versus USSR. USSR stands for? United Soviet Socialist Republic. Okay, very good. United Socialist Soviet Republic. There you go. Um, so Democrats... Um, you know, Democrats really take power, uh, in power, even though you'll have this lull of um, Dwight D. Eisenhower uh, during the 1950s, but you really have the Democrats in power, especially through Congress, uh, until, um, until 1969, 
uh, when Nixon uh, Nixon uh, takes uh, charge, okay, takes the oath of office. Uh, you also politically have, of course, the civil rights movement. Um, and when we say civil rights movements, is it just black people protesting? No. no. Do we have Native Americans protesting? Yes. yes, we have the A movement, American Indian movement, as it was called. Uh, does anybody remember what famous prison they occupy? Alcatraz. Alcatraz. They're still painting on Alcatraz from this um, this uh, this protest where uh, Native Americans were um, uh, took over the island. Okay. Um, also, uh, what other rights groups do you have? I have a picture of him over there. It's important in California history. One of the most important California history names is Cesar Chavez. Chavez. Very good. Ladies and gentlemen, Cesar Chavez is not Shea Caveira. So many students mix those up. Shea Caveira yeah. is that guy over there who started a lot of communism in South America. Those are the victims of, of Shea Caveira. Uh, that is not the same as Cesar Chavez. Cesar Chavez is a really important name with Hispanic culture. Uh, can anybody remember what Cesar Chavez does? I always forget. There we go. Uh, Cesar Chavez, yes, he organizes the grape protest, right? The bo the the boycott, right? Yes, very good. Huerta, Huerta, Huerta. It's an association of farm workers nationally. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Fighting for farmers' rights. Yep, exactly. Well done. So you have the um, United Farm Workers Association. Um, so you also have, um, are there Chinese uh, fighting for rights in uh, California as well? Yes, you have what's called the Yellow Peril, okay? Um, they called themselves that, the Yellow Peril. Um, that was in San Francisco. Uh, do you also have gay rights? Yes. Does anybody remember any? Uh, does anybody remember in the 1960s, 1968 to be? Uh, was it 1968 or was it 1969? Uh, the Stono, um, the Stono. Uh, uh, no. No, it's not the Stonewall Rebellion. It's the Stonewall Inn. Thank you for reminding me. It's the Stonewall Inn. Um, um, uh, I guess massacre. That was where. Remember, there was a gay bar that a bunch of cops went to and started arresting people. Uh, it was a huge um, issue and everything. Does anybody remember the first? Um, was he governor, no, not governor, um, um, mayor of San Francisco? No, um, who, who was openly gay. Does anybody remember? He gets shot. Oh. Harvey Milk. Man, did you guys not read the 1960s? Harvey Milk, okay. What's up? Oh, um, have you never flown to uh, San Francisco? Um, if you go to, ladies and gentlemen, if you go to the San Francisco airport, there's a whole tribute to Harvey Milk in the airport because uh, he um, he was a uh, I I, I want to say he was either a and I should know this either a mayor of San Francisco or a councilman, uh, pretty important uh, there, and he gets shot because he's gay, okay, uh, and dies. Um, so that was a, um, that was a, a um, 
I guess maybe that would have been a little bit more uh, cultural, but when we were talking about political protests and everything, uh, do we have any women's rights? No, not really. Do what? Uh, I would say equal rights amendment for women fails. Okay? Ladies and gentlemen, the equal rights amendment was proposed in early 1970s Richard Nixon, the Congress, and the Senate all passed it. It had to go to the states, okay? And it fell short of three states uh, passing it, okay? Um, so when it came up again, um, Ronald Reagan wouldn't sign it and subsequent presidents um, it hasn't really come up and everything. So uh, that movement, uh, that Equal Rights Amendment, fails. Now, does anybody remember why did why were there people who said, "Oh, Equal Rights Amendment is not what you think. It might not be good." Think about the Vietnam War. Do women want to be drafted into war? No. Okay. Um, however, ladies and gentlemen, maybe the answer is maybe they don't have a draft, right? Maybe. Um, but the idea was is that um, there were those like Phyllis Schlafly who argued that, Amer that uh, women are already a privileged class and that any type of equal rights means like equal burden too, okay? And so there were those who fought against it. Um, good. What about work exchange technology? Uh, you know, after World War II, um, I would say we were the only country, um, you know, kind of unscathed uh, by World War II. Okay. We also have the baby. Uh, well, we'll get to we'll get to baby boom later. Um, uh, we also have uh, the invention of the computer, invention of computer. Um, in the nineteen seventies, we have a bad recession, economic recession, right? Uh, so we have issues. We have our recession that happens in the 1970s. Uh, this is during um, both Ford and Jimmy Carter. Uh, we have you know huge gas prices. People are in line for gas. It's really tragic. Um, there's a lot of rationing of gas. Um, in the 1950s, uh, how is religion? Um, the 1950s is a big religious uh, era, okay? A lot of people are going to church. Um, also, uh, the... the um, what is it called? The, uh, the pledge that we do in the morning. Ladies and gentlemen, why do we do the pledge to the American flag? You're exactly right. Okay? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in the 1950s, the pledge was not something that we did before the 1950s. Oh, that, that case. But in the 1950s, uh, I think you're thinking of a different one. You're thinking of uh, Santa Fe uh, versus... I remember reading something. Yes. Uh, that's that we can't have prayer... Um, in schools, like with um, uh, at football games and everything, but when it comes to the pledge, that was we were basic. It was basically a litmus te test that you were not a communist. Okay, we were so afraid of communism in the 1950s with the Red Scare that um, you know we uh, we started putting that in, and and so uh, maybe culturally at this point, or maybe a little bit earlier. Uh, the other part, we had the uh, Red Scare of the 1950s, right? Uh, politically. This is the second Red Scare, the famous Red Scare, right? Um, 
This so, was yes, this one was a crucible. Very good. Um, that was that one. So, 1950s religious era. Um, we also talked about social movements, social movements with civil rights. Um, we also have protests against the U.S. by students. Okay. Mainly about what? Students, protest, um, government over, you're right, we would have SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, that do the sit-ins, okay, over, uh, we could say, civil rights and draft, uh, NOM, the NOM draft, Vietnam. Um, good. Then when it comes to um, people moving, um, you know, people move from the cities to suburbs, right? So initially, people were moving at the turn of the century from farms to factories or ur uh, sub suburban or, or rural, rural to urban. But now they're moving from, uh, from urban to suburban. Okay? Urban. Oh, gotcha. Put a D in there on that. Um, so we have that happening. Um, we have very little immigration till 1965 when our policies start to uh, change. So little immigration until 1965 policy uh, changes. And the policy changes to allow skilled labor, to allow skilled immigrants. Okay, so these immigrants that have uh, skills will accept them. We also have what's called the boat people or people from Vietnam that are coming to America because they're escaping the persecution in Vietnam. Um, so I don't want to hear anybody say this. This is not a derogatory, or this is a derogatory term, but the term fresh off the boat that characterized these brand new Vietnamese that um, were brand new to, to San Diego even. Okay, if you go to Linda Vista, um, is there... Is there a shortage of pho in uh, San Diego? No, there, there's quite a few pho everywhere. And that's because we have a big Vietnamese population, okay? Um, it's pretty amazing, like, if you were to find uh, some of the older Vietnamese, uh, I'm sure they would have great stories, really, really tragic stories of the fall of Saigon, right? Uh, the Vietnam War when... Um, uh, when we pull out of Vietnam, then all of a sudden we have to evacuate those who supported uh, America because it's a death sentence to them when the North Vietnamese start coming. Uh, we had a teacher who used to teach here who flew Chinook helicopters, and he was part of the fall of Saigon. Okay, he was you know transporting people from you know uh, Saigon to the uh, U.S. aircraft carrier, and he actually has pictures of them pushing Chinook helicopters off of. The, uh, uh, the flat tops, the, um, the, the aircraft carriers, because they didn't have enough room. So they had to start pushing you know, these, these helicopters off to make room. Correct. One of the yeah. aircraft carriers was USS Midway. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah you, you might be right. Yeah. So they do talk about it. Interesting. OK, cool. All right, geography. Um, do we have any pollution? Yes, yeah, serious pollution. <laughs> Okay. Um, uh, in 1970s, my boy Richard Nixon, uh, he addresses this with uh, EPA. 1970s EPA addresses uh, addresses concern. Okay, so that concern with the environment. Um, we also have a dependence on oil fuels, international conflicts over that. Uh, then when it comes to America and the world, uh, we have these. Uh, well, well, let's, let's focus on Cold War first. 
You're not right. Yeah, I mean, you're not wrong. Cold War, um, you know, directs most of, okay, directs most of foreign policy, right? Um, to, what's that, what's that Truman Doctrine term? The policy of containment, right? To contain, okay, contain. Like <laughs> communism, okay? So contain communism. Can we hope to roll back communism from other countries? No, we can't eradicate communism from Russia, from China, but we can maybe stop the spread. That's the idea. Stop the spread of communism. Um, this uh, leads to Korean War and uh, Vietnam War. Um, so this is slowly replaced by the conflicts in the Middle East. So replaced by conflicts in Middle East. Okay? So you start having these conflicts in the Middle East, uh, especially over oil, because OPEC, Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, they start saying, hey, we don't like what America's doing uh, with, um, um, you know, supporting these leaders that we don't agree with. Okay, that's the thing with America. If you were the president and you were asked, should you support a president that, su that the people support or should you support a president that, you know, is pro-America, okay, which one do you support? It's a tough situation, right? Because you're a, you're, a, you're a president, you want to support America, but how do you do that if that person is not supported by the people? That's what happens in Vietnam, right? Ho Chi Minh asks America for help against the French. And we're like, Ho Chi who? Like we basically snub him, okay? And then he goes to which large country for help? China, okay? And that's when the Vietnam War becomes our war. We had the opportunity to listen to Ho Chi Minh and we don't, and that creates the Vietnam War, okay? Sad, uh, sad situation. All right, let's take a break uh, for about, let's do a seven-minute break.